Well, I'm here to preach the gospel again in Kidderminster after two days in London, and uh, almost feels like an anticlimax, but it's not because the gospel has to be preached. And until we see <coughs> people repenting of their sin and coming to faith in Jesus Christ, then there's no turning of the tide, there's no change, nothing is... Everything is the same, the rebellion against God, the, the, the judgments of God shed abroad in the land. We must have confidence in the preaching of the gospel. We must preach this word. So, by God's grace, I intend to preach it now. Father, I ask and pray you'd have mercy on the people of Kidderminster. I ask and pray, Father, that the word of God would be preached here fully, faithfully and powerfully. And I pray, Lord, that you would have mercy upon those who hear, that there would be a finding of your grace, of your salvation. And I ask, Lord, that you would raise up more preachers of your gospel and that you would uh, deliver sinners from their sins and bring conviction of sin, Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy upon Kidderminster. Have mercy upon England. Have mercy upon our nations. Father, these things I ask and pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I'm aware my voice is a bit croaky from having preached for what was a short time, but in a very tense environment yesterday in London, um, outside the entrance to Westminster Abbey, and uh, if my strength is starting to fail, then my prayer would be that God would raise up. My prayer would be that anyway, that God would raise up many strong young men to do this work and fill them with his spirit and anoint them. And bless those who are preaching his word. There are many who are. Um, but that the gospel will be preached. Well, anyway, I'm going to preach it now. So good afternoon. It's my pleasure, privilege to be here. I'm here to preach the gospel. I'm here to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is my beloved Saviour, who has saved me and delivered me from my sin. I want to look at today on these words in the Bible, which is the Word of God from the first book of John, which is towards the end of the, the New Testament. And we read these words in 1st John chapter 4 verses 14 and 15 and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God God dwelleth in him and he in God <clears throat> and we have known, this is verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us, that's the Christians God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So we're told here very specifically that if we have faith in Jesus Christ, if we confess the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are saved, that we know God, that we have salvation, that we are delivered from our sins, that we do have a relationship with Almighty God, that we have received the love of God, that we have been subjected to that love of God, that we know that love, that God's love and his mercy have been poured out on us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Now, first of all, we should say this, whosoever confesseth that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. That's what John is telling us here, and then we must confess this. That immediately tells us that Islam is not a true religion because they do not confess that Jesus is the Son of God. This is really important. Those of you who say all religions are the same, those of you who say Islam and Christianity worship the same God, if you deny that Jesus is the Son of God, as Islam does, Islam denies that Jesus is the Son of God, then you cannot know God. And whatever God you serve, whether it be Allah or somebody else, is not the God of the Bible. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God the Son. The Lord Jesus is God the Son. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Saviour of the world. Now, it was necessary for the Lord Jesus Christ to come into the world 
to become a man, to become flesh, to dwell among us in order that we might be saved. If we have faith on him, in him. If we have faith in him. So again, going back to verse 14 of 1 John chapter 4, we read, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. <clears throat> God the Father sent God the Son, that's Jesus Christ, into the world to be the Saviour of the world. Hence we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It wasn't that we were worthy of salvation. We're not worthy of salvation. It's not that God is obliged towards us. God is not obliged towards us. God is obligated to deal with sin, to judge sin, to condemn sin. And we are sinners and we are guilty. It's that God the Father agreed with God the Son that the Son, Jesus Christ, will come into the world to be the Saviour of the world. This is God's way of salvation. Now, God didn't make ten ways, or twenty ways, or two ways. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he is the Saviour of the world. That is the clear teaching of the Bible. There are no other saviours. There is no one else who can deliver us. There is nobody else who can take away your sin but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is nobody else who has dealt with the wrath of God, which Jesus did when he was on the cross of Calvary, when he was being crucified, and the wrath of Almighty God was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ in the place of sinners. He bore the punishment for sin. The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. God the Father agreed with the Son. God the Father sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to come into the world, to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, to be frail and weak like we are, to be hungry and thirsty and tired and weary. But the Lord Jesus never sinned. He never broke God's commandments. You obviously haven't read the Bible, sir. The Lord Jesus never sinned. The Lord Jesus never broke the commandments of God. The Lord Jesus always did that which was right. But we are sinners. You need to repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus and he will give you salvation. It is the Lord Jesus that forgives us for our sins. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can make us clean. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can take away our sins. Only the, the work that Jesus Christ did, the work which he accomplished on that cross of Calvary, <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, he is the saviour of the world. He is the only one that can deliver us from the wrath to come. The Lord Jesus sent by the Father, God the Son sent by the Father into the world to be the saviour of the world. Now if, like the Muslims, we deny that Jesus is the Son of God, oh, they say we have very good respect for Jesus, he's a prophet. But no, if Jesus were just a prophet, he could not be the saviour of the world. And if we believe that Jesus is just a prophet and we deny that Jesus is God, then we have the spirit of Antichrist. Islam has the spirit of Antichrist. So you see, Jesus is the Son of God. And we read here, the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. There is no other name. There is no other Saviour. There is no one else that can deliver us from our sins. Well, will, they, will, will, they, will they give me ten pounds? The, the gods? No, they, there is only the one God. There's only one God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, well. And if we believe on Jesus, we'll be saved. And repent of your drunkenness and believe on the Lord Jesus, and he will have mercy on you, and he will save you. A drunk couple asking for ten pounds. What I have is worth far more than that. What I have is worth more than the whole world. The gospel. Jesus Christ was sent by the Father, God the Son, was sent by the Father to be the Saviour of the world. Your sins need to be forgiven. 
God sees your sin. He knows your sin. And only the Lord Jesus will take away your sin. He died for sinners. He became a sacrifice for sin. His blood was shed. His body was broken in the place of sinners. The Lord Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. The Lord Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of Almighty God. Now Jesus Christ is seated on the throne of heaven today because he is God. And it's his rightful place. He is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, on the throne of heaven. That is where the Lord Jesus Christ is today. So if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are rejecting the God who made the heavens and the earth, the eternal God. The God, who, my friends, who sees you. The God who hates sin. The God who hates your lies. The God who hates your lusts, your covetousness, your greed, your swearing, your lying, and so on. The God who hates sin. The God who cannot do evil. A God who is holy, who is righteous, who is just. A God, my friends, the eternal God, the living God to whom we must give an account and before whom we must stand on the day of his wrath and give an account to him because of our sins which have separated us from God. We need a saviour. And God the Father sent God the Son into the world to be the saviour of the world. Now, we believe in one God, but there are three persons within the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is God the Son, and he is the Saviour of the world. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He is both God and man. He died and he was resurrected. He paid the penalty for sin, so that whosoever calls on his name and believes on him, their sin is forgiven, and they have everlasting life. We need to repent... <coughs> We need to repent of our sins and turn from our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that we might find the salvation that comes from Almighty God and that we might have everlasting life. Turn from your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin, cast yourself upon the mercy of God and believe on the Lord Jesus and he will forgive you. You see, without Jesus Christ there is no forgiveness. In Jesus Christ there is total forgiveness for all of our sins. Now, I was visiting, I was visiting the General Assembly or the General Synod, shall we say, of the Church of England yesterday at which things took place which, according to the Bible, are exceedingly wicked. Things which will not only divide the Church of England, but bring down the wrath of God, not only upon that church, the Church of England, but upon the nation. The Church of England has elected to reject the Word of God. The Church of England has elected to turn away from the Scriptures, to believe a lie, to compromise the word of God, to go with the flow, to believe in the spirit of the times. And they have brought the wrath of God upon themselves and they will bring it upon the nation. God sees what took place in the General Assembly, the General Synod of the Church of England yesterday, when they voted to bless same-sex relations in churches. And for the record, I say same-sex sexual relations. Not only does the Bible condemn homosexuality, but it condemns sex outside of marriage. So whichever way you look at it, this is condemned. But they go along, they reject the Bible, they reject God, they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And they decide that they will be trendy and they will go with the times. They cease to preach the gospel, they cease to warn men about their sins. They cease to call men to repentance from their sins and to a saving, living faith in Jesus Christ. But here we read in 1 John chapter 4, God the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world, and whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. 
The Church of England will no longer teach that, cannot teach that. The Church of England has ceased to be a church. The Church of England has ceased to teach the truth. The church where you have bishops and archbishops, which you don't find in the Bible, you don't find bishops and archbishops in the Bible, but they have bishops and archbishops. If they claim to be teachers sent by God, then there is only one mark that we should look for to see whether what they say is true. Do they speak unswervingly, fully, finally and with authority everything that the Bible says and reject everything that the Bible doesn't say? That is their duty. That is the cloak that they've taken upon themselves, never mind their pretty <laughs> robes and things that they wear. And these men have rejected the word of God. These bishops, these archbishops, I say men, some of them are women. They have rejected the word of God. They have trampled the blood of Jesus Christ underfoot. They have forsaken the sheep. They are blind leaders of the blind. They are, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, there are many people in the Church of England who still love the Lord Jesus Christ. I know, I met many of them. Some of them spoke up yesterday at the General Synod. And there are people in the Church of England who still hold to the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. And there are people in the Church of England who still name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour from all sin. The Bible says they now must leave, they now must come out of the Church of England. Abandon her to her fate. Let her fall. Let her die in her folly, in her madness, in her sin. Let her fall apart at the seams. She is under the wrath of God. She is under the judgment of God. Make no mistake, at the General Synod of the Church of England yesterday, God's name was dragged through the mud. And God's salvation was forsaken. And God's truth was ignored. You want to know why there are atheists in the land? It's because there's atheists in the Church of England and in the pulpits. That was the um, cyclist uh, stopped and shook his head. Thankfully, he didn't try to intervene. You see, we are living in exceedingly wicked times. The Bible says to the word and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this book, this word, it is because there is no light in them. There is no light in the Archbishop of Canterbury. There is no light in the Archbishop of York. There is no light in the Bishop of London. They have forsaken the light. They have turned aside to idols. They have led the flock astray. They have fallen into a ditch. They are perishing in the way. They have turned to idols and loved their idols. They have forsaken the fountains of living water. They are blind leaders of the blind. And is it any wonder if there is wickedness in high places when those who claim to be the leaders of the people of God teach them lies and errors and follies? And I tell you, it is a wicked day for our nation that God sees it, that God sees the perfidy, foolishness, folly, madness, infidelity <coughs> and wickedness of the Archbishop of Canterbury and his cohorts and his enforcers when they turn away from his word. Jesus Christ is Lord. They have forsaken the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have ceased to teach that God the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. They no longer believe that. They believe that the church should be some happy, clappy place where everybody's happy and has a nice time, even though their lives are falling apart. But you see, they fail, they fail to warn us what sin is. It is the duty of any preacher of this book, of this gospel, to warn you what sin is. Homosexuality is sin. Pornography is sin. Lusting is sin. And God looks at the heart and he sees you. And it is the duty not only of the Archbishop of Canterbury and his cohorts and his enforcers, the Archbishop of York and the Bishop of London, who is a woman, when the Bible says that women cannot teach or lead in the church, that's not me, that's what God says. If you have an issue, you take that to God. And you see who is right. God is right. God is always right. Because God cannot do wrong. But you see... 
They have not only failed to say what sin is, but they have embraced sin. They have failed to call sinners to repentance from their sins, saying that now God commands all men everywhere to repent. And the Archbishop of Canterbury and his cohorts and his enforcers have failed to say, to warn people to flee from the wrath to come. I have never heard Justin Welby ever say anything that I thought was worth saying, ever. But I have certainly never ever heard him say that there is a wrath to come. The Lord Jesus preached on hell. The Lord Jesus told us that he will cast sinners into hell on the day of judgment because they never repented of their sin and they never believed on him to the salvation of their souls. He will say to them, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But you see, but you see, I've never heard the Archbishop of Canterbury, I have never heard the Archbishop of Canterbury warn people to flee from the wrath to come. But the Lord Jesus Christ warned people all the time that there was a wrath to come and that there was a judgment to come, and that we must flee from the wrath to come, that we must repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus to the saving of our souls. Again I say, God the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Jesus Christ is the Saviour of the world. In this run-up to Christmas, I know it's November, in this run-up to Christmas, the whole point about Christmas is that God the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. And Jesus Christ is the Saviour of the world. And he will save you from your sin. And he will have mercy on you. And he will deliver you from your sin. And he will give you everlasting life. If you acknowledge your sins. If you turn from your sins. If you repent of your sins. And you cast yourself on him. I have never heard the Archbishop of Canterbury say that. Yesterday... Most of the debate was all in the General Assembly or the General Synod of the Church of England. Most of the debate was about people's feelings. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We want people to feel included. Nothing about warning people from their sins. Nothing about calling them to repentance from their sins. Nothing about the cross. Nothing about the agonies and the torments and the suffering that the Lord Jesus Christ endured upon that cross as he made a sacrifice for sin. As he was nailed to that bloody Roman gibbet and raised up between the heavens and the earth. And as he became a sacrifice for sin and laid down his life in the place of sinners such as you and me. And while Jesus Christ was on that cross, the wrath of God was poured out upon him. <coughs> because he became sin for us so that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the wrath of God, my friends, will be poured out on the Church of England. The wrath of God will be poured out on the Church of England for her perfidy, for her wickedness, for her unbelief, for her foolishness, for her folly, for her wickedness, for her madness. God's wrath, God's wrath is kindled against the Church of England now. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Those who are truly Christians need to come out of the Church of England now. They need to forsake her. They mustn't wipe the dust off their feet when they leave her. When they come out, they must not look back. Remember Lot's wife, who looked back when she came out of Sodom, when God was destroying Sodom for its sin of homosexuality. They mustn't look back. They must come out. They must come together. They must join together in worshipping God outside of the camp. The Hebrews chapter 13 tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified outside of Jerusalem. And those who want to be Christians need to come outside of the camp. Where it's not popular to be. 
where you may be pilloried or persecuted or even put to death as many Christians in the world are even in these days for your testimony to Jesus Christ and the Bible says Jesus said that we should count the cost of serving him if you become a Christian there is a cost to being a Christian if you turn to Jesus Christ there is a cost if you would desire to bear full, faithful, continuous testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour from sin, then there will be a cost. Now I tell you, as a result, as a result of what took place in the General Synod yesterday of the Church of England, voting to bless same-sex relationships in churches, that is same-sex sexual relationships in churches, something which God hates, the sin of sodomy for example, which God hates, <coughs> the Church of England is finished and is ruined. And God's judgments against our land <coughs> and God's judgments against our nations will not end there. If the Church of England has shown herself to be pathetic, spineless, gutless, jelly-like, devoid of truth, devoid of backbone, devoid of any kind of Christian teaching whatsoever, the cruel, the cruel stand ready in the wings. You see, the Church of England has voted to destroy itself. The Church of England is calling down upon itself the fire of heaven, so to speak, that it cannot stand and that it cannot remain. The Church of England is under the wrath of God. Come out of her, you Christians. Come out. Those who love the Lord Jesus Christ, as I love the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of the Church of England now. Get out of there, get out before God pours out his wrath, before he pours out fire and brimstone on the Church of England for her sins <coughs> and for her wickedness. Furthermore, those who think that Christianity is misogynistic, those who think they don't want Christianity because Christianity is against women, which is an absolute fraudulent lie, We'll have to find out very soon, I think, how much they like Islam. And I think that if Islam takes over in this country, as it's set to do, because there doesn't seem to be any law or anything um, that can stop what's taking place, then I think people will be begging for Christianity, but they won't be able to find it because they'll have no one left to teach them. No one left to instruct them. No one left to show them the paths of righteousness. Islam will never, fail, will never deliver you from your sin. Islam will never make you right with God because it has no sacrifice. The Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And without the Son of God you cannot have everlasting life. So John says in the book of 1 John chapter 4 verses 14 and 15 and we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God dwelleth in him and he in God no Profession of that from the Archbishop of Canterbury yesterday in London. No profession that Jesus is the Son of God or the Saviour of the world from the Bishop of London. No profession that Jesus is the Son of God or the Saviour of the world from the Archbishop of York. I know, I was there, I sat there, I listened to what they had to say. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There is no light in these bishops. There was one bishop who spoke up for the truth. One bishop. But you see, Jesus Christ is the saviour of the world. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. Jesus Christ was sent into the world by God the Father to be the saviour of the world, to save sinners from their sin, to deliver us from the wrath to come. 
The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. It speaks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So what is it for you, my friend? Will you repent of your sin? Will you repent of your lies? Will you repent of your unbelief, your godlessness, your idolatry? Will you repent and turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Saviour of the world and who will save you from your sin and will deliver you from the wrath to come? There is a wrath to come. The fires of hell are ahead of you. There is a place of eternal burning and wrath and fiery indignation of Almighty God forever and ever and ever. And the only escape and the only way that we can be delivered from the wrath to come and we can know the salvation that comes from Almighty God is through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. You know, I could wish that the gospel was being preached like this in every Church of England pulpit every Sunday. If it was, this nation would be transformed. But you can go to churches, you can go to what they say, and you never hear this preached. This is the simplest thing. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And those who put their faith in him and repent of their sins are saved forever from their sins. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Very soon the Lord Jesus will be revealed on the clouds of heaven. At his second coming, are you ready for him? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you repented of your sins? Have you turned from your sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might find the salvation that comes from Almighty God alone? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Turn from your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will have mercy on you. If you don't find Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. If you don't find the Lord Jesus Christ here in the Bible, you see, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. God the Father sent God the Son, the Son of God, to be the Saviour of the world. God has a Son. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And God the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. There's a group of Muslims listening. And the Son came into the world to save the world. He came to die on the cross. He came to lay down his life. And I have myself believed on Jesus Christ and my sins are forgiven. And I have peace with God. And I am saved from my sins by the power of Almighty God. And all the love of God is revealed in this gospel. Those who say just teach love, I could stand here all day and tell you that God loves you and you wouldn't care. But if I tell you that God loved you so much that that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins, you'd be offended. If I told you there's a wrath to come and the love of God sent the Son to save you from the fires of hell, you'd be offended. But oh, the riches and mercy and God's love, that it is love in God's love. In God's love, in all of the love of Almighty God, he sent his Son, he sent Jesus Christ. And so we must repent of our sins because we cannot escape the wrath to come and we cannot escape the fires of hell without faith in Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the love of God. That we would find mercy through faith alone. In Jesus Christ alone. Turn from your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you shall be saved. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. His blood was shed. He laid down his life so that sinners like you and I could find the salvation of God. If we believe on him, we have everlasting life. If we reject Jesus Christ, we cannot be saved. We must repent of our sin and cast ourselves on Jesus Christ. We must trust Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of our sins. 
There is no one else. There is no other saviour. God didn't send anyone else. Jesus is the saviour of the world. He was dead, but he is risen. He has destroyed death. He has triumphed over the grave. He is alive. He is risen. He is ascended. He is reigning in heaven. He is soon, soon coming on the clouds of heaven in glory. Are you ready for the day when Jesus returns? Are you ready for the day of your death? It is appointed unto man once to die, and after death comes judgment. Turn from your sins, turn from your evil ways, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Amen. Now I noticed that uh, one of the things that was said at the General Assembly was that uh, some Anglicans have, Church of England people, have difficulty understanding why it was that God poured out fire and brimstone on Sodom. And that was something that somebody also said when I was up in in um, Kendall, or sorry, Keswick rather, earlier this year, that uh, the person who was teaching false doctrine at Keswick said to me that he didn't know why God had poured out fire and brimstone on Sodom. He said that there were many possible reasons but of course it's quite obvious to anybody who reads the Bible that God poured out fire and brimstone on Sodom because of sodomy well it was also raised at the general synod that um, we didn't know why it was that God poured out fire and brimstone on Sodom what kind of casuistry what kind of wickedness is this surely God has given us that that happened to Sodom as a warning What kind of wickedness is it that twists the scriptures and says we won't hear this warning because we don't want it. We prefer our sins. We prefer what we can do. We prefer our own ways. What kind of wickedness is that? And then also repentance as a principle of the most profound depth in the heart of the believer whereby repentance is far more than just an external change but something that radically transforms a person's heart which marks a radical transformation in a person's heart repentance was also dismissed as something that was hard to define biblically that's my understanding of what was said that we're not really sure about what repentance means. Now, if the Church of England is teaching that we don't know why Sodom was judged by God and why fire and brimstone was poured out from heaven, from Almighty God, on Sodom and Gomorrah, there is no hope for us. If we don't know what repentance is, if we aren't prepared to put away our sins and turn from our sins and cast ourselves on God and confess our sins, then there is no hope for us. And that's what I picked up from the General Assembly, the General Synod of the Church of England, that there is no hope for them. But there were many Christians there, and there were many votes against the measure that was carried. And there are many Christians still, and they must come out now. They must come out. They must forsake an organisation that is calling down the wrath of God from heaven upon itself and upon the nation. So if you are... GAFCOM, or you are Church of England, but you love the Lord Jesus Christ, but my call for you is you would come out of her because she is she's finished and with her the nation. But to those who know the Lord Jesus, who are Christians, we don't need Anglicanism, we don't need the Church of England. We just need the Lord Jesus Christ. The speaker's a Baptist. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. He He is our He's our strength, he's our song, he's our shield, he's our defender, he's our saviour, he's our beloved. Amen. Father, I pray for the word that was preached today and for those who went past. I pray that it would come with convicting power. I pray, Father, that people would be awakened. I think, Father, one of the things that surprises me, one doesn't surprise me, is that the people walking past couldn't care less about the Church of England anyway, whatever she does. They gave up on her years ago. They ceased to take us seriously years ago but they don't know what judgments will now fall on the land because of what's happened. Father, I pray for your church, I pray for your people. I pray you'd have mercy upon us and help us to walk with Jesus and to be faithful to him. And I also pray, Father, that you would bring revival, Lord, that if Jesus was crucified outside the camp and if we must be outside the mainstream churches, which call themselves churches but clearly have no fear of God before their eyes, then I pray you bring us together as your people, Father, to serve you. And I pray you'd add daily to those who are being saved. Have mercy upon us, Lord. 
Have mercy upon England, have mercy upon our nations, Lord. Turn the tide, awaken the people. Have mercy, we ask and pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.